ادعوا الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادلهم بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو اعلم بالمهتدين بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع الهدى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters in Islam Welcome all of you to our hadith discussion in which we are doing a short review of the book Hidden Defects in Prophetic Narrations Al-Kashku Fi Dhikr Al-Hadith Al-Ma'lul Doing a quick review, a summary and commentary on this short compilation which mentions some of the principles and techniques that the student of knowledge needs to know and specifically the student of hadith should familiarize themselves with in order to discover hidden defects in some of the prophetic narrations so the importance of having knowledge about how to discover hidden defects is prime and fundamental. All students of knowledge, of Islamic knowledge, should have some basic knowledge of mustalah al-hadith. This is why many times when students embark on their journey to seek knowledge in some of the Islamic universities, you'll find that the majority of the programs at the universities will encourage the students and will actually have muqarrarat and part of the curriculum they will have at least one introductory class to mustalah al-hadith because of the importance of this knowledge for all the students of the sharia but any disciple any hadith disciple or student of the sunnah or student of hadith they should try to dive and delve a little bit deeper into the books of Mustalah Hadith to the best of their ability, trying to memorize, trying to understand, trying to compare the books of Mustalah Hadith and learn how to apply Mustalah Al-Hadith through hands-on instruction, through training, through research. And this is done with qualified scholars and qualified teachers as we mentioned previously the ability to discover hidden defects is the most noble branch within the sciences of hadith far exceeding all other branches of knowledge of the sunnah of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so much so that some of the great scholars from amongst them abdurrahman ibn mahdi rahimahullah he said to know one hidden defect in a hadith is more beloved to me than writing down and learning a hadith that I didn't know. Subhanallah. In another version, it said that he mentioned knowing a hidden defect in a hadith is more beloved to me than writing down 20 hadith that I didn't know. Subhanallah. And this was from his understanding and his great efforts in trying to preserve the sunnah and bring out any mistakes or blemishes that may be in some apparently authentic hadith and to clarify them to the people as a nasiha to the ummah. So in order to acquire such an ability, a student of hadith needs to train with the masters and experts extensively through years of research, years of practice, and continuous study. Only then will the student of knowledge, and specifically the student of hadith or the disciple of the sunnah, be able to scratch the surface about the techniques of how to recognize and detect hidden defects in different prophetic narrations. So it is preferable that the student of knowledge, specifically the student of hadith, should start at an early age. When we look at the Salaf al-Salih, when we look at the 
the righteous predecessors, the previous generations, they would start off their with their children memorizing Quran. And then as soon as they memorized Quran, then they would start them in studying Hadith. So we would encourage that the young students of knowledge would embark first and foremost upon learning how to read and recite Quran with proper tajweed, then move on immediately after memorizing the Quran and understanding the Quran to go on to studying the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we encourage that student of knowledge that they should start reading and studying a hadith and narrators. So opening up some of the books of hadith that contain the hadith with their chains of narration while slowly and progressively memorizing the hadith along with their chains of narration. And <clears throat> we do have some good primer books. There are some good primer books for the beginning student of hadith, which they do not contain the chains of narration, but they do contain the texts, the matun of the hadith which the student is advised to start with, starting off slow with easy hadith, which are easy to memorize, then moving on to the larger books. So the student of hadith, they should start with the mukhtasarat, the summarized smaller books, then moving on to the mutawalat, the detailed longer books. So specifically in regards to hadith, the student should start with books such as the 40 hadith of Imam and Nabawi. Then after memorizing that, they should move on to Umdatul Ahkam. Umdatul Ahkam. Then move on to a larger book, Bulugh al-Maram. Then move on to memorizing Riyadh al-Salihin. Riyadh al-Salihin. So upon this methodology, the student of hadith will be well-grounded and extremely knowledgeable about the hadith concerning the principles of the religion, hadith related to rulings, what is halal, what is haram, and virtuous and meritorious acts and statements. Then, after the student memorizes these four texts that we mentioned, then they should move on to studying and familiarizing themselves with the six books of hadith, starting with Sahih al-Bukhari, then moving on to Sahih Muslim, then moving on to the four Sunan, and the Sa'i, Abu Dawood, at tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. And the student of Hadith should start familiarizing himself with the chains of narration and the narrators. And he should also familiarize himself with the books of biographies and gradings of certain narrators and try to start to memorize their names and gradings. And two of the uh, most comprehensive and concise books for memorizing certain narrators and their names and gradings is Taqrib al tahzib by Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and Al-Kashif by Imam al-Zahbi. So upon this methodology, you'll find that the student of Hadith will build himself up and progressively learn many hadith related to ahkam, many hadith related to fada'al, and many hadith related to some of the usul of the deen. Then after long years of practice and experience, the student may be able to learn and eventually master the science of discovering hidden defects if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills and grants him success. So knowledge of hidden defects in hadith is the most technical and difficult aspect of knowledge related to the sunnah. And only a few individuals truly understood and mastered this science in the past. And it's very rare now that we find someone here in our day and time. One of the biggest imams who had a very extensive knowledge of ilal and hidden defects in hadith from our generation who passed away, Al-Allama, Al-Muhaddith, Al-Mujaddid, Shaykh Muhammad Nasruddin, Al-Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And for this reason, many of the scholars used to say 
that discovering and clarifying some of the hidden defects in hadith was considered like magic or sorcery to the layman. And this was because the layman could not fathom or understand how the scholar of hadith reached a conclusion about a particular defect in a hadith or with a certain narrator. The layman would become amazed and mesmerized by the extensiveness and preciseness of the hadith scholar's knowledge, the hadith scholar's memorization, his understanding, his preciseness, and his accuracy. Others would say that the knowledge of discovering hidden defects is inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we would call ilham, which is different than wahi. An example of ilham is what Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he mentioned uh, from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that amongst the people preceding you, there used to be muhaddithun, people who can guess things that come true later on as if those persons have been inspired by a divine power. And if there are any such persons amongst my followers, then it is Omar ibn al-Khattab. So this type of ilham, which Allah sends in the hearts of these individuals, these scholars of hadith who spend hours upon hours, years upon years, and dedicate many years of their life, studying hidden defects is intuition from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah would open their eyes and their hearts to see things that other scholars would not see and this is because of their constant studying their researching and contrasting the different routes of transmission and the narrations and the scholars would say that the ability to discover hidden defects in the narrations was like the ability of the money changer to distinguish the counterfeit and the real money in coins Sometimes some of the money changers, they knew just by looking at the coin without even feeling it. Other times the money changer would know by smelling the coins or the bills or by weighing them. They knew which currency was counterfeit and which dinars and dirahim were real solely from their years and years of extensive experience in dealing with the money. And this is somewhat similar to how the scholars of Hadith would detect hidden defects. It was mentioned to Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. Somebody came to him on one occasion and he said to him, Oh, Abdurrahman, you say about some hadith, this hadith is authentic, this hadith is sound, and this one is weak and this one is not sound. On what basis do you say these things? So Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, he replied to him, he said, Have you ever gone to the money changer and given him your dirhams to be inspected? And the money changer says, this is good, this dirham is fair, and this one is counterfeit. Do you ask the money changer about how he knows about this, or do you believe whatever he says? The man replied, he says, no, rather we take his word for it. So Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, he replied, he says, similarly is the knowledge of hadith, and in particular knowing hidden defects. It is known by many years of research, studying, debate and experience so just how the money changer knows the quality of the gold and silver coins by comparing them with other pure coins made of gold and silver if the coins are different in their texture their weight their look then the money changer knows immediately that these coins are counterfeit just like the jeweler knows the fake jewels when he compares them with the real diamonds the real crystals and the precious gems if they differ in their hardness, if they differ in their liquidity or purity of color, then they know that they are made of glass, crystal, or rocks. Similarly, the authenticity of hadith were measured and compared by the adala, by the behavior that one carries himself as a righteous, somebody who fears Allah, a pious person who avoids open sins and acts of disobedience. So the adala of the narrators, and by observing if that which they transmitted is in accordance with that which the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ would say, and was it transmitted exactly the way he said it. And one way that the scholars would recognize a hidden defect was that if only one individual narrator transmitted the hadith or a specific wording, 
and his adala was majhul, it was unknown or weak, which is what the scholars many times refer to as a tafarrud, a tafarrud, okay? And the reason why discovering hidden defects is considered one of the most difficult and intricate sciences related to the sunnah is because it is related to criticizing the narrations in a way that is undetectable to the naked eye. And it is not directly related to al-jarh wa ta'deel, criticism and praise of the narrators. Nor is it related to whether the narrator lacks preciseness or honesty. Adala wa dabt. Rather, discovering hidden defects revolves around discovering the mistakes made by trustworthy, righteous, honest, accurate narrators. It's like trying to find a sewing needle in a haystack or trying to find a single flea on a flock of a hundred sheep. So discovering and knowing whether or not a hadith is free from hidden defects is also the summary the final product, the extract and fruit of all the other sciences of hadith. All the other sciences of hadith are at the service of the sciences of discovering hidden defects. And by utilizing this science, by utilizing this science of hadith and specifically the science of discovering hidden defects and its techniques, the scholar can discover many things. He can determine who are the mudallisin, who are the narrators who hide a defect in the chain of narration and make it appear to be sound. Either by a narrator reporting from the one whom he has heard from something that which he did not hear from him, using such a wording as will leave the impression that he heard it from him which is called Tadlis al-Isnad, or it would give the scholar the ability to discover a narrator who narrates a hadith which he heard from his sheikh and gives his sheikh a name or kunya or title which is not normally known in order to disguise his identity, which is called Tadlis al-Shuyukh. So by utilizing this science of and the techniques of discovering hidden defects, the scholar can discover who are the mudallisin, what words are mudraj, which words are added on to the original text, or which words or narrators are added on to the chain of narration. The scholar can also distinguish which hadith are mursal, and which hadith are mawquf and mawsul. So hadith mursal is a narrator from the end of the chain after the tabi'i is missing, that a tabi'i, he says, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says. So the, the companion is, is omitted and the likes. So brothers and sisters, this branch of hadith sciences is the only branch that enables scholars of hadith to testify to the soundness or weakness of the narration. And when we look at our scholars of the past and from the closest of, uh, of scholars to us uh, regarding time-wise was Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al-Din al-Bani, whom compiled two great encyclopedias of hadith, which he distinguished between the authentic and the inauthentic hadith. He has a whole encyclopedia called the Silsila Hadith al-Sahihah, a whole encyclopedia in which he gathered up and researched many books of the Sunnah and put all the authentic hadith in this book. And then he has a whole another encyclopedia which mentions all of the hadith which are weak from many different sources of the Sunnah. He did a great khidma to Islam and specifically the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there is still much work to do within the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it is upon the students of hadith to study hard, to learn mustalah hadith, to dive into the books of Matun, 
the Kutub al-Sitta, the Masaneen, the Sunan, the even some books may be still in the darkness in the Makhtutat. They may still be in manuscript form, which ha they haven't been brought out from the darkness into the light. So this branch of knowledge, brothers and sisters, is the only branch that enables scholars of hadith to testify to the soundness and the weakness of the narration. And it was not possible for them to be certain of the narration's authenticity except through examining and investigating the hadith through utilizing this branch of, of knowledge as a microscope to find the hidden defects. Nor was it possible that a hadith be considered acceptable except by knowing whether it contains a hidden defect or not. And mistakes, mishaps occur to all narrators. Those whose memories were strong as well as those whose memories were weak. They were also found amongst those who transmitted some of the narrations and those that criticized narrations and narrators. So knowledge of this science and being reminded about the efforts that Ahlul Hadith and the scholars of Hadith and the great Imma exerted in this field is vital and extremely important to know solely because it brings the prestige and honor back to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and amongst the Muslims. And I found something which is very common amongst many of the students of hadith and many of the students of knowledge that we have had the opportunity to spend time with. That in the year 2023, we're living in a time when many beginner students of knowledge, specifically students of hadith, have tried to tread the path of investigating and examining hadith and have tried to make rulings upon different chains of narrations and narrators alone without looking to see if the chain of narration or text has some odd or conflicting wordings, shadud and without investigating if the hadith contains a hidden defect. Many students of knowledge now, they just immediately refer back to Taqrib al tahdib by Ibn Hajar and blind follow what he says about the narrators without referring to any other books of Jahu Ta'dir. And yes, this is the first step that the student of knowledge should tread upon to become familiar with the methodologies of the scholars of hadith. However, the student should also familiarize himself with other books of Jahu Ta'dil, with other books which mention the different darajat, the different ranking, the different statuses and gradings of different narrators. They should familiarize with the other books of Jahu Ta'dil as well that can aid him in learning the different terminologies that the scholars of Hadith use to grade narrators, such as Al-Kashif by Imam Al-Dhahbi, Al-Thiqat by Ibn Hibban, Al-Jarh wa Ta'dil by Ibn Abi Hatim, Tahdib al-Kamal by Al-Mizzi, Ikmal Tahdib al-Kamal by Mughlatai and others. So the student of knowledge, the student of hadith from the beginning should not become bigoted to one particular scholar's view about narrators. If the scholars differed in regards to the grading of that certain narrator, rather the student of hadith should try to learn and read and understand what the scholars of hadith intended by the terminologies they used in their books for grading different narrators and exert his efforts in researching and training oneself while at the same time respecting, honoring, and taking into deep consideration the rulings and gradings of the scholars who preceded him. So, I found that many of the students of hadith, many of them haven't even read one book on ilm. Many have not even scratched the surface of the knowledge of hidden defects of hadith, which will give them a complete and comprehensive understanding of ruling upon the narration. And unfortunately, we find them, or they're, they're still making rulings upon narrators and narrations. And specifically in the USA, we have those who busy themselves or they say that 
they are busying themselves with the sciences of Jahu Ta'dir. And many of them can't even read or understand Arabic. Many of them cannot even recite the Quran with proper tajweed. They say they, they study the, the principles and the techniques of Jahu Ta'dil, but they're not students of knowledge. And they're definitely not students of hadith. You find them using the terminologies of the scholars and the principles and the the qawa'id of the scholars of hadith to rebut and refute anyone who disagrees with them without understanding what those principles, what those qawa'id mean, or what contexts they were used in. But when you ask them to grade a hadith or narrator in one of the books of hadith using those same words, they called their brothers, they find it impossible and lack the ability and know-how. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all. A great narration by Imam al-Hakim al-Nisaburi, as he mentioned in his book al Ma'rifa. And also Al Khatib al Baghdadi mentioned in his book Jam Ali Akhlaq al Rabi wa Adab al Sami. He said that a man came to Abu Zura and asked him, What's your evidence that this hadith has a hidden defect? So he replied, He said, My proof is that you come and ask me about a hadith that contains a hidden defect, and I mentioned the hidden defect. Then go and ask Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Wara. But don't tell him that you asked me about it. Then he will tell you the same thing. Then go and ask Abu Hatim about the hidden defect in the hadith. And he will mention it as well. Then compare what everyone said about the hadith. And if you find that we all mention different things about the hidden defect in the hadith, then know that every one of us spoke from his own opinion. But if you find that all of us said the same thing, then know that this knowledge is real. And this knowledge is true. So then the man, he went and asked all of them and found that all of them agreed as to what the hidden defect was. Then he said, I testify that this knowledge is divine inspiration and intuition from Allah, meaning through many years of extensive study, experience, and research. SubhanAllah. Imam al-Sakhawi, he mentioned in his book, Fath al he said, this branch of knowledge, meaning the branch of discovering hidden defects, amongst the sciences of hadith is the most technical and most difficult to understand. For this reason, you don't find many of the scholars spoke or wrote about it except the masters of hadith and its sciences, such as Ali ibn al-Madini, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam al-Bukhari, Ya'qub ibn Shayba, Abu Hatim, Abu Zurah. So, my dear and beloved brothers and sisters, students of hadith, the ability to discover hidden defects and narrations is based upon, first and foremost, knowledge of the sunnah, memorization of the sunnah, and experience while mastering the principles and fundamentals within the sciences of hadith. One should not think that the scholars of hadith just depended upon their experience without having any principles or fundamentals to base their conclusions upon. And one of the great students of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, he was asked in his book, Al-Munar al-Munif, in which he gives principles and techniques about weak and fabricated narrations. He said about if there exists a principle without studying the chain of narration that one can know if a hadith is fabricated or not. So he responded. He said, this is known by one who has immersed himself in the ocean of the authentic sunnah. His blood, his flesh are filled with knowledge of the sunnah until he attains mastery of the sunnah. The narrations of companions, knowledge of the Prophet's life and history, his guidance, knowledge of what he prohibited and what he commanded. So in order for somebody to gain the ability and to tread upon the the path to be able to discover hidden defects, they need to immerse themselves into the ocean of the sunnah. They need to immerse themselves and dive into the ocean of hadith, of narrations, of narrators, of the books of Rijal, of the books of Mustarah. 
so that every bone and every vein and every piece of flesh and every muscle is filled with love of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, brothers and sisters, having knowledge of hidden defects in some hadith is not always restricted to specific techniques or principles. You'll find many times the scholars would discover and mention the presence of hidden defects in a hadith based upon supporting evidences or other general principles that the scholar had learned through years of experience and research. Sometimes you will find that the scholars of hadith would give precedence to a narrator that raised a marfu' narration to the Prophet, and other times to one who omitted a mursal, who omitted the companion. Sometimes they accepted both chains, the mursal narration, the one with the companion omitted, and the mosul narration, the one that was connected. Other times they would refrain from speaking about the narration altogether. Sometimes the scholars would accept the extra wording in the text, while other times they would consider it a hidden defect. Sometimes they would accept the narration if a narrator narrated something alone, which is called a tafarrud, and other times they would consider it a hidden defect and reject it. Sometimes the scholars would give precedence to the narrator with stronger memory when the narrations are conflicting. Other times they would give precedence to the narrator with a weaker memory solely because of other factors corroborating evidences that influence them in their decisions about those particular hadith. Some of the scholars of hadith considered the farud of a narrator to be a hidden defect even without the presence of other narrators conflicting with what he narrated. Sometimes we find the scholars of hadith would perhaps reject some hadith that a trustworthy narrator individually and solely based upon their experience and extensive research of hadith, narrators, and hidden defects, and the different routes of transmission. So the student of hadith should be informed that the narration that is narrated by a trustworthy individual alone is not like other narrations. The student of hadith and the disciple of the sunnah should be sure to research, be cautious, and pause in making a ruling upon a narration as being a hadith which has the farud or a hadith which is shad or hadith fard and increase their research and reading until he is 99.9% that it is a hadith fard and it is a hadith which contains the farud. Because if a second narrator narrates the same thing, then the oddness or defectiveness, the nakara or the shaduth, is removed. Especially if the trustworthy narrator is not known for his memorization and preciseness. And this was the methodology of Imam Ahmed. This was the methodology of Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan and Ali ibn al-Madini and many, many others. And there are many examples that we find numerous scholars of hadith where they would reject the extra wordings of trustworthy narrators. They would reject the ziyadat from the thiqat, ziyadat the thiqat, they call it. And in our next discussion, we will talk about that briefly and give some examples of this. So we hope today's discussion was beneficial and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it. And until next time, we look forward to joining you for hadith discussions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.